Hey, good morning. Good morning. As most of you probably know, I'm Sean. I'm the assistant pastor here at Crossroads, filling in for Pastor Michael, who is out of town today. And you know what? Anna, the buyers, Pastor Anna and her husband, are also out of town today. So it's like I could do whatever I want. <laughs> Except that they're going to watch the stream later, and then if I do anything out of line, you know, maybe I won't be here next week. I don't know. But, oh, he can, he can, Thomas said he can mute the stream, so they won't even know. I, we'll edit it out in post. But hey, I'm Sean. I am excited to be here. This, the thing that I'm going to actually talk on is something that when we first started talking about this series, I thought... I've never thought about that verse that way before, and that may, means that I would love to share about that, because I don't know how it is for you guys, but when I read something and find something different about it or read it a different way for the first time, I want to share that with other people. Yeah, so we've been doing this series called Don't Quote Me on That, which is looking at different misquoted passages in the Bible or sayings that aren't in the Bible that people use because they sound nice and they sound like they're in the Bible. And we've been looking at them so that we can say, hey, you may not want to quote them on that, right? It's this verse that you're saying does not mean what you think it means. And it's been fun. We've been looking at some different ones. And today we're going to do one that I think, well, I'll say this. The songs that we just sung are kind of along the same theme as the verse that we're going to look at. Maybe it was a little bit subtle, but I planned that out on purpose. Uh, what did we just sing about? We sang about how God can break down every wall, how God causes giants to fall, how he can be on our side for our breakthroughs. Uh, let's see, he shed his blood so that we can be freed from the shackles and chains of sin, made us righteous through that blood, how he is with us in the wilderness, right? And he provides for us. And lastly, how he's our strong God. Amen? Amen. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It sounds like he's there for us, which he is. And he works in us, which he does, and he died for us, which he did. Heck, we can do anything through him, right? Amen. Which is exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So if you've ever stepped into a Christian bookstore, you've probably seen this verse. Or if you have that friend that likes to put verses on their Facebook wall, if anybody even does that anymore, or at their real wall, like you walk into their house and you see this big verse painted on their wall. I've seen that before. You've probably seen this verse somewhere. And if you haven't, a lot of you probably heard it a couple weeks ago. Pastor Michael actually used it in this side, uh, side story that he told where a guy had this verse tattooed on his arm. Do you remember what it was? Anybody? Through all things. Yes. Okay, bring that up then. Philippians 4.13. You don't have to turn in your Bibles to it because we're looking at it in a different version. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which sounds really good. I mean, doesn't that give you the warm and fuzzies? Yes. Yeah, it does. And when we read just that verse by itself, you really do think, well, I could do whatever I want. But... As we've been seeing in our series through the past few weeks, some of these verses don't mean exactly what we think they mean when we actually look at their context. So that's what we're going to do today. And before we do, as I was researching this verse, I went to my friend and overlord, Google, and <laughs> typed this in to see, okay, what kind of things are people using this for? And I wanted to share some of them with you because some of them, I think they're great. If you want to bring up that first image. Okay, so here we go. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can climb that mountain. He, God is going to help me get to the top of that boulder. Right? Okay, bring the next one up. There you go. He might give you some superpowers or some extra strength, especially if you're a kid. But I think you have to wear those goggles in order for that to work. Yeah, next one. This, I love this one. Okay, this is a little ant. And he's carrying this stick with this epic sunset in the background. Like, God is going to help you lift that stick. 
which is funny to me too because an ant can probably lift like 10 times what that little stick weighs. But that's neither here nor there. Next one. This one is great too. Jesus is literally helping this guy lift weights. And a lot of times, I mean, that's what we think. God is going to give me the strength to do the accomplishments that I need to do, right? Yes. Hey, bring up that next one. This is, that, here we go. I can do all things. He might actually help you get better at basketball, I think. <laughs> I think that's what this is saying which is good for me because I've always had my eye on that roster spot on the Kings, right? We'll come back to that. <laughs> Go ahead, bring the next one up. <laughs> this one might be a little bit convicting for those of you in the back that can't read it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then this, I don't know why it's a cat, but the cat says, you don't even go to church when it rains. <laughs> that stings a little bit. All right, this last one. This one is even smaller, so I'll read you through it. But this one is, uh, it, it kind of speaks to exactly what we're talking about through this series. So it's a comic strip, and the first guy says, bro, what are you doing? And the second guy says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to jump off this building and fly like a bird. And the first guy says, dude, hold on. That's not really, I can do all things, as he jumps off. And then the first guy says, except read Bible verses in their proper context. <laughs> right? That's what we've been talking about this whole time. Because if we don't read the proper context, we can end up, I mean, maybe nobody's going to actually jump off a building, but we can use these verses to hype ourselves up, to do things that it's not actually saying it does. So, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the context of this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And before, as we do, we're actually going to put our Bible nerd hats on. So why don't you all get your Bible nerd hats and put them on? Yeah, there we go. Oh my gosh, I feel, I can't believe you guys did that. I feel like I'm teaching a bunch, I feel like I'm in an elementary school classroom, which made me really, really proud. Just doing what my mom used to do. Um, so we're going to look at a few different translations. And translation is another great way that you can understand context. Because all these different translations are slightly different ways that people came together and said, well, I think this word or this phrase means this over here. And so reading through different translations can help you understand a passage that you might be struggling with if you only read one. So we're going to start with one in the New American Standard Bible. So the New American Standard Bible, NASB, one of the more popular ones. And we're going to start back in verse 10. Okay, so that was Philippians 4.13, which is the end of this. We're going to start back four verses previous to that, or three verses before that. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at, le at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity to act. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with little, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. NASB. So that version is more of a word-for-word -word translation or a literal translation, where in this case, this was originally written in Greek, what, what is this? These kids are doing, what, is that like clapping? What is that? Clapping? Oh, silent clap. I'm getting a silent clap. <laughs> so a literal translation takes the original language, which in this case, this is a New Testament. This is Greek or ancient Greek, really, not the same as the Greek that they speak in Greece today. And they look at the words and they say, well, this word means this in English, this word means this in English, this word means this, and they string those together, they change the syntax around a little bit and add some articles so that it's a sentence that you can actually read, and voila, there you go. Literal translation. It's one of the more well-known literal translations, but I've got a surprise. We're going to read an even more literal translation because it's fun. So why don't you bring the next one up? We're just going to read the last two verses in that. I have known both to be abased and I have known to abound. In everything and in all things, I have been initiated, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to be in want. For all things, I have strength in Christ's strengthening me. 
Yeah, that's a little more confusing, isn't it? That's the Young's literal translation, which is even more word for word, less syntax rearranging. And we can see that translations can help us or can also sometimes hinder us from understanding because of our modern understanding of English. So we're going to look at now the opposite end of the spectrum. So those were pretty word-for-word literal translations. The next one, if you want to bring that up, this is the NLT, the New Living Translation. It says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So this is a a paraphrase translation, or maybe that's not the perfect word, but a phrase-for-phrase translation is probably better, where they look at phrases, and they say, well, this phrase in the Greek meant this, so in English, the closest phrase is this. And it's a little less accurate in a word-for-word type form than a literal translation, but it helps us to understand because we're looking at complete phrases rather than just stringing specific words together. And the last one that I want to look at is the one that we read through most from the New International Version, which is kind of a mixture of word for word and phrase for phrase. And it says this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So, did you catch that? There's a little bit of a difference in that one, isn't there? A little bit of a difference in that last verse. All the other ones said, I can do all things, or I can do everything through Christ or through him who gives me strength. But this one says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Well, why? Why would they change? Why would the NIV translators change that word when it seems like everybody else had a fairly, or had a, consensus for the most part on things. Well, it goes back to what we're talking about. It goes back to the context. The translators of this verse or this version decided, you know what, if we put things in there, people might mistake this and think something that it doesn't mean. So let's make this word this so that it's more understandable in its context. At least, I mean, I wasn't there when they were doing it, so that's my, that, that's what I think they were probably doing. And I think that when we look at the context, it makes the most sense. So we start to see exactly what the all things were when the word is this, I can do all this. We start to see what all things is actually referring to. So let's break it down then. I have three different things that I pull out of this verse that, that show how we should be reading it, how we should be understanding it, instead of maybe how some of us have used it or how we've seen it used out there in the world. And the first one is this. It's not about, or it is about contentment, not accomplishment. I almost got that backwards. <laughs> it's about contentment, not accomplishment. So Paul was writing this because he found the secret to contentment. He was content in Christ's strength. He lists off a number of circumstances, right? He lists off all these different things, some good, some bad, but nothing necessarily that you would brag about as an accomplishment. You wouldn't go to your friend and say, hey, hey, guys, check out, check it out. I'm well fed, (laughs) right? I mean, at least if you're a normal person, you probably wouldn't do that. But these aren't accomplishments that Paul is talking about. He's not talking about winning that sports game or closing that business deal or even some successes in ministry. He's talking about the secret to contentment. That's what Christ's strength is for. The world today is full of an unlimited number of things that promise contentment. An unlimited number of things that if you buy into it, they, th- they will say, hey, this is what you need. Sometimes food can be that. We can find temporary, at least, contentment in food, and the world says, this is what you need. Or possessions. I mean, we measure success by the number of possessions that we possess. Amen. And 
as many of us probably know or have found out, and even if we haven't, as we can see by looking at the lives of the people who have striven for those versions of contentment, those things don't last. They end up being meaningless, right? If you guys are reading the Bible in a year with us through the Bible app, we just finished the book of Ecclesiastes this week. And what's the refrain throughout the book of Ecclesiastes that Solomon writes over and over again? All things are meaningless. All things are meaningless. meaningless. There's nothing new under the sun. These are the refrains. And by that, he's referring to all these different activities or the possessions or the relationships, all these different things that we pour ourselves into, it's all going to come to naught at the end. It's all meaningless in the scope of eternity, but what lasts is God and our commitment to him and our fulfillment through him, and that's what Paul was clinging to. If you look at some of our Christian forefathers, the people that we look up to, you can see this idea. A couple that I thought of were John Wesley. You guys may have heard of John Wesley or know who he is. Uh, If you have been around this church long enough, you may have heard us say that we're part of the Wesleyan denomination, which just means that our theology and our methodology for doing church is similar to what John Wesley thought and how he did things. But he lived a fascinating life. And we talk about being content. So in his day and age, if you were a preacher or a Bible teacher, you could get into, you could have a job at a nice church. I, you think this church is nice, but the churches that they had in Europe and where he was from in England that are old and just beautiful inside, and you would be well taken care of as a bishop or a priest. And he could have had that. He had the education, but he said, you know what? These, these churches, they're not bringing in all the people, there are a number of people that don't want to come in here. So what he did is he forsook all that, and he went out into the places where you wouldn't see preachers go, where you wouldn't see priests occupy. He went to the bars. He went to the, uh, well, they, they weren't called bars, they were called pubs, right? <laughs> they, he went out into the streets, and he preached Jesus in the streets, and he had this massive effect on the general population, the lower population. And he was famous for saying this phrase, make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And by all sources, he actually lived that out. He is purported to have lived on 30 pounds a year as his salary, which in today's money, that's $10,000. $10,000 a year would not get you very much today. But that's what he chose to live on. Even though his actual salary increased and increased, at one point he was making 1,400 pounds a year. But everything over 30, he gave away to different charities or ministries. He lived out this idea that his contentment is in Christ's strength, not in possessions or anything else. Another one that I wanted to highlight real quick because They were, or at least one of them was just here. Vivek and Darla are missionaries in India. And we support other missionaries that this is true for as well. But because we just saw Vivek, it's more visceral to us, I think. He and his wife gave up a normal life. They gave up a normal life to go serve in India, to go preach to anybody that would hear, anybody that would give themselves to Christ. And it's not easy because there's persecution in India. But they, that doesn't phase them because their contentment is in the strength of Christ. And especially for Darla, I mean, for Vivek, it, is, it, it was a, a thing to give up whatever he would have done and go uh, preach Christianity. But he's from India, so it's not as huge as it is for Darla, who gave up a typical American life and went to a foreign country she's not familiar with at all. She's learning the language, which is not an easy language by any stretch. But their contentment isn't in all the possessions or the things or the whatever. Their contentment is in the strength that Christ provides. Think about that for a minute. Could you do the same? 
Could you find contentment completely in Christ's strength? I mean, what if you lost your home? Could you find, could you say honestly, like, yeah, this happened, but my contentment is in Christ alone? If you could only live on one meal a day, man, this sucks, but my contentment is, is in Christ alone. That's really tough for the American lifestyle. But that's what Paul trusted in. That's what Paul means when he says, my strength comes from Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Doesn't mean that I can do all the things that I'm set out to accomplish, but it means that I have contentment through all of the things that, Christ, that Jesus brings me through because my contentment is in Christ alone. When we face circumstances that, have, that offer us no hope, then we need something bigger than our circumstances. Amen? Amen. And that brings us right to this next idea, that this passage, what Paul said, this is as much for God as it is for you. What do I mean by that? Do I mean that we are here like egging God, or not egging, but encouraging God on to come along? Like I could just picture somebody saying, okay, Jesus, I've almost got enough power. Come on, you can do it, buddy. You could just a little bit more for me. All right, yeah, almost there. No, that's not what I'm saying. No, what I'm saying is Christ's strength is as much for God's purpose as it is for you, right? In fact, Christ's strength is a really scary thing to pray for because when you are living on Christ's strength, it usually means you need it because you are so far outside of your comfort zone that you can't do it on your own. And living outside your comfort zone is a scary thing. So when we say, my strength is in Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that's a really scary verse. That means wherever Christ takes me, his strength is going to provide for me. It goes back to the verse that Ken actually, or not the verse, sorry, the saying that Ken talked about a few weeks back. God won't give you more than you can handle, right? Well, as Ken pointed out, first of all, that's not a verse. Secondly, it's false. God will give you more than he can handle, than you can handle, but not more than he can handle. But again, he also gives you his strength to go along with those things that you can't handle. Because he works through us for his purposes. Now, I think about characters in the Bible that perfectly model this. There's so many that you could choose from, but I wanted to highlight a couple just so we can see, like, this is a real thing. This isn't just me standing up here preaching it. You think about the story of Joseph in Genesis. God gave him the strength to endure being cast off by his brothers. I mean, he started out a pretty cushy life, the most loved of all the sons that his father had. But his brothers were jealous, so they sold him into slavery. He, God gave him strength to endure that. He was imprisoned after some circumstances that he had no control over. And eventually he rose up to the right hand of Pharaoh. And because of that, he led Egypt through, and his own people, through an incredible drought. But God gave him the strength to face each one of those things. And then another example is Paul. I mean, Paul is the one who's writing this, right? So obviously we know that God gave him, or Christ gave him the strength but think about what Paul went through. In one of uh, the passages in the New Testament, Paul goes through a list of all the things that he's endured. He endured prison. He endured flogging. He endured beatings. He endured stoning. He endured shipwrecks. That's shipwrecks with an S because there's multiple shipwrecks that he endured, which is crazy. I mean, how many ship? Anyway. And untold other dangers as he was doing his ministry. But he found the secret of contentment in Christ's strength through it all. And Christ gave him the strength to endure so that he could continue doing the purposes of Christ, right? Yeah. 
and you think about Joseph, God had that all planned. That famous line in Joseph's story, for such a time as this, right? God had this all prepared for such a time as this. Can you imagine what Joseph's life would have been like if he hadn't been able to rely on God's strength? God wouldn't have been able to use him for his purposes to save Egypt and ultimately his own family from that terrible drought, that seven years of drought. Or what about Paul? We cannot under, understate the impact that Paul has had on the church and had on the early church when he was preaching too, when he was going from place to place ministering and sharing the gospel. We can't understate that impact. But he did it through Christ who gave him strength because that strength of Christ sent him into some places that he was not ready for, right? So next time you pray for God's strength to do something or endure something, I'd urge you to pause and think Think about what you're actually praying for. Like, are you praying for that strength because you feel called into something that you know you're not going to be able to do on your own? Like, God is calling me into this thing, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. So through Christ, I can do all things, right? Through his strength, I can do. That's, that's pretty legitimate, that goes along with what Paul is saying here. But are you saying, if you say, hey, through Christ, uh, Christ gives me strength, and through him I can do all things, to, I can win this football game this evening, or I can close that business deal, or I can accomplish this great ministry feat, that's probably not exactly the way to use this verse. And I'm not saying that God won't strengthen you through those things. And I'm not saying that he won't accomplish his purposes through that. I'm just saying that we have to be a little bit more discerning on how we use this verse so that we're not using it to essentially champion our own agenda, champion our own goals. Which takes us right into this next point, this last point that I want to share. This passage teaches us humility not hubris, right? Hubris, another word for pride. Humility is the word of the day, the word of the hour, not hubris. And yeah, this will overlap a little bit with some of the, the couple of last points that I mentioned, but some of us use this verse to embolden us in our own goals, in our own accomplishments. If going back to that example of basketball, you know, I could focus my entire life on getting into the NBA. Sure, I'm not even six feet tall. Sure, I'm almost 40. Sure, I've never really been great at basketball. And I probably never will be great at basketball because I don't spend eight hours a day practicing. But you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, so sure, I could do that, right? And when you go into something with that mantra, no one will be able to tell you what a fool's errand you're embarking on because you have this trump card in your own head that is really more about your own pride than it is about your humility in front of Christ. It's more about your own pride to do this thing than it is about listening to God and using his strength to do his purposes. See, that's the problem. It's about what I set my mind to. And we kind of take God along for the ride, right? Yeah, amen, bro. I set these goals, and you know, God will meet me in these goals that I set. And I'm not saying don't set goals. I'm just saying sometimes the goals that we set are really for us. They're not from God. And that is in complete juxtaposition to what Paul was talking about. Paul wasn't taking God along for the ride. Paul was getting taken along for a ride, Amen. right? I mean, think about his Damascus Road experience. He's blinded by Jesus, and Jesus is like, hey, Paul, this is what you're going to do. And Paul's like, uh, okay, I guess that's what I'm going to do now. And he, 
Even when Paul wanted to do, there are a number of times in the New Testament, actually, where Paul wants to do something and he's not able to do it. He wants to, the, one of the examples of this is actually in Acts 16, verses 6 through 7, which is not going to be up on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase it. But Paul wanted to go preach the gospel in Asia with his companions. He wanted to go there. It was a great thing that Asians need to hear this gospel message. But what does it say? It says, the spirit of Jesus prevented him from going. That's all we get. It just prevented him. Now, Paul could have strong-armed his way and done it anyway, maybe, but Paul wasn't taking Jesus along for the ride. Paul was getting taken along for a ride. Amen. He knows he doesn't call the shots. He knows he's not steering the ship. And it's not about what he wants to accomplish. Now, these realities are a lot different than the way that we often use this verse. And because of that, this verse should humble us. It should humble us to realize that this strength that Christ is providing us is not for us, right? It's for God. Amen. So as you go through your life and you face challenges or opportunities, think about how you can clothe yourself with humility as you embody to live this verse. Because it's in the humble life in front of Christ that we see he provides. He does things beyond us. When Jesus was here preaching and teaching the gospel, he sought out the least of these. He sought out the poor, the broken, the outcasts, the, the people that nobody else wanted to go to, kind of like John Wesley. And so I think if we're going to use a verse like this, we need to be like those people. Because those are the people that God uses for incredible things. So those are three ways that I think we can read this verse better and use this passage better in daily life. But I didn't want to stop right there before I close out. I wanted to highlight a couple other verses that are very similar, talking about almost the exact same thing and are sometimes used in conjunction with this to say, to provide the same idea, the same theme. And I feel like it would be a disservice if we just hit this Philippians 4.13 and we didn't hit these other ones because then someone could say, well, yeah, Philippians 4.13, okay, fine, that means that you can endure or you can find contentment. But what about this other verse? Doesn't that say the same thing? So the first one is this. It comes from Luke 1.37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Again, we're going back to the NASB, New American Standard Bible, because in NIV, they actually translate this differently. Um, but let's read this in context. Like I said, I'm going to go through these a little bit more quickly, but uh, go back to, not, not go back in the PowerPoint, but go forward in the PowerPoint, which goes back a couple of verses to verse 34. But Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, also the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called infertile is now in her sixth, sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. Right? So this, first of all, this is about the Christmas story. This isn't just something that we can use, or at least it's not used for just any ordinary occurrence. This is about a specific event that happened. And Mary is saying, well, hey, I'm a virgin. How am I going to bear a child? And the angel says, look, nothing is impossible for God. You're asking this question, but nothing is impossible for God. But what this really means in this context is not that oh, we can do anything we set our minds to because nothing is impossible for God, right? No, what it really means is whatever God says goes, Amen. <laughs> right? The reason I have this in the NASB is because the NIV, again, translates this a di little differently. The NIV says, for no word from God will ever fail. See, he's talking about this thing that he promised to marry. He promised her this, and so it will not be impossible. That will not fail. 
Now, that's great. It's good. But I want to do one more. This one comes from Matthew 19, 26. Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Again, very similar, almost the same. And maybe you've seen this, first of all, it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds great, and it is. Maybe you've seen the last part of this, with God, all things are possible, printed on a shirt or you know, on a wall somewhere also. I have another meme for you guys, and this one's good. I'll let you read that, but let me read it to you also. You can't expect to eat junk food, never work out, and get abs. And this guy says, well, first of all, through God, all things are possible, so jot that down. <laughs> and let's be honest, sometimes that's how we use this verse. Yeah, amen. And why not, right? When we pray for our food before a meal, don't we expect a magical transformation of all that junk food into just the right ingredients so that we can get that six-pack that we're looking for? That's what happens with our prayer for our food, right? Am I wrong? No, I'm not. I'm wrong. (laughs) But that's how we treat it. So let's look at this verse in context. Let's go back to verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So you see, again, this is a very specific use of this verse. And I'm not saying that there's no other place to use it, but what I am saying is when we understand what Jesus is talking about here, when he says it's impossible, or it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, obviously, we've seen, most of us in here have seen what a camel looks like, and most of us in here have probably also seen a needle, and even if the needles that they had in those days weren't quite the same size or tolerances that the needles that we have today are, you would still be able to say it is obviously impossible to send a camel through the eye of a needle without some really gruesome side effects. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I wasn't going to say anything. But. but Jesus is using that as an example to show how impossible it is for us to be saved on our own. How impossible it is for us to enter God's kingdom without God ushering us in. So, thank God that he sent his son for our sins, that he sent his son, and by his blood, we can find forgiveness, and we can enter that kingdom. And it's not just the eternal, but it's the here and now, as we surrender our lives to God, as we surrender our lives to Christ, we enter that kingdom here and now in order to push forward his kingdom, in order to proceed in his kingdom values. I'm going to ask you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if that is something that you haven't yet experienced, you haven't yet made a decision to surrender your life to Jesus, and you want to enter his kingdom, I would ask that you just raise your hand for me so I can see, so we can pray into that, so that we can pray into this life that Jesus promised us. And if you are in that spot where you just like, I don't know, how I'm going to continue going. I've just been doing it all wrong. And even though I have made that decision before or I've, I said I've surrendered, I haven't really been living it. If you want to rededicate yourself and say, Jesus, I'm, I'm ready to start this again, then you too, can you raise your hand so I can see So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm just going to pray. 
And if you want to pray with me, feel free to pray with me. Lord, I thank you for sending your son. I thank you that through him, through the blood that he spilled on the cross, we have access to your kingdom. That it is possible for us to be ushered into your presence because of a sacrifice of your son. Father, we surrender ourselves today. We surrender our lives. We surrender our motives, our accomplishments, our destination, our plans. We surrender it all to you, Lord, so that you can use it and so that you can give us the life that we've truly been seeking. I lift these things up in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the spot where I would normally invite the worship team up, but since half of it is already up here, I'm going to invite the lovely Carla Cardozo to come up. And you know, as we go into this next set of songs, take some time to really reflect on this passage, what, that, what it means that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Maybe how you've been using it improperly in the past, or maybe how you've learned a little bit more about it. Yeah, amen. But think about how God might be giving you strength to find contentment in whatever situation you're in, whether right now you're well-fed or you're hungry, whether you have all the possessions you want or you don't, which I think most of us would probably say we fall into that category. Pray about if God is giving you that strength, how he is calling you to something beyond your strength, something for his purposes, something where he is moving you and using you. And then pray about how you can more effectively live this out in humility rather than using our own pride as justification for doing the things that we want to do.